So sitting immediately to my right, uh, who you have seen earlier today, where she gave a wonderful presentation uh, talking about uh, the, the, the Night News Challenge Award that she's won, uh, is uh, the wonderful Jillian York. Jillian wanted me to mention uh, that she is in no way prepared for this discussion because uh, she found out about 9 o'clock this morning when I pulled her aside and asked her if she would participate. That said, Jillian is, generally speaking, one of the world's best prepared people for this discussion. Um, she heads up international advocacy and international programs, international freedom of expression for the EFF, um, has worked on international advocacy and freedom of expression for a long, long time in Global Voices and in other contexts, and we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Um, to uh, further to your left, to my right, uh, is uh, Nathan Fritas, uh, the benevolent dictator uh, of the Guardian Project. Um, and I'm glad that you called that out early on. It's, it's good to, to take ownership of these sorts of things. I, I'm the guy with the mic. That's all, always got a certain amount of dictatorship associated with it. Um, also deeply involved uh, with the Tibet Action Institute. Um, someone who has been coding and working through issues of freedom of expression online uh, since before he was a teenager, uh, someone who's thought really deeply about these issues from a technology perspective. Uh, and finally, on the end, uh, our dear friend Emily Bell uh, from the Tao Center at Columbia Journalism School, um, formerly with a different Guardian project, uh, the pioneering uh, British newspaper, uh, where she was the head of digital content. Um, and one of the reasons, uh, basically in general, if I can put Emily on stage and on a panel, I do so. But specifically in this case, I uh, wanted to have her here um, so that we could talk through some of the implications of surveillance for the journalism community, which was something that we were both involved with an open letter. And the Tau Center is now very, very involved with questions of journalism post Snowden. We're not going to back up and do the entire Snowden revelations here. It's been an incredible year, and I'm guessing that most everyone in the room has at least a cursory familiarity with the story. What we're going to try to do instead is have a conversation about questions of the world post-Snowden in terms of what does this mean uh, for activists? What does this mean for anyone trying to protect their communication through technical channels? What does this mean for journalists and for sources? What does this mean for any of us who are interested in trying to use uh, the digital public sphere as a space where we can organize and where we can debate? Uh, and so, uh, because she's had such a lousy day, uh, I thought I would start uh, with Emily and sort of Thank ask you. if you can talk a little bit about this question that we found ourselves addressing in this open letter. W what do we think the Snowden revelations mean uh, for journalists and for their sources? Okay, thanks, Ethan. Um, two things. First of all, I was not detained because I was speeding. Um, I was detained because I ran into somebody, and it was my fault. Um, <laughs> I know you're not supposed to say it was my fault in America, but I'm British, so it's like, I'm sorry, that was my fault. Um, <laughs> and also, if you're going to run in someone, run in someone nice, preferably another woman. So we chatted, I charged her phone, she was like, oh, it doesn't matter, you've towed my car. Sorry, back to the issue in hand, which is, um, what, do these what, what do these revelations mean for the journalism community? Well, it's kind of, I mean, we, we, we can get into some detail in a minute because there are very specific, I think, security implications, which most journalists, including, it has to be said, Glenn Greenwald, who was the recipient of the leaks, simply weren't aware of. They didn't kind of practice good digital security. There are a small number of journalists who are forced to practice di good digital security because they are, um, you know, working in extremely challenged, very physically dangerous environments. But they're a tiny percentage. And in general, uh, I think the journalism community pre-Snowden, um, two things, one of which was, you know, it's, it's actual newsroom practices in terms of digital source protection were very poor. And this is something that we owe a great deal uh, of debt already to um, activists, you know, from the EFF, etc. cetera. Uh, Chris Ahoyan, who pointed out sort of, you know, two years ago in an op-ed in the New York Times, because it was in the New York Times, everybody read it, saying journalists need to kind of really sort of brain up on this kind of stuff. But I think there's a broader implication as well, which was um, something that I'd been concerned about for quite some time, even, even when I was uh, still kind of operationally working at The Guardian, which is that we had this kind of, as journalists, we had this um, 
So we're almost inappropriately close relationship with the technology <laughs> industries, that there was a kind of a, an outsourcing, not just a function, but also of thought to Silicon Valley. Like you would go around, like people, every time I met a major kind of, you know, some chief executive or director general of this or that major media organization, they would always be, I've just been out to Palo Alto and I've met Facebook and I've met Twitter and I've met Twitter. Um, uh, and Google, aren't Google great? Uh, and I didn't, you know, I don't want to kind of come over all of Janie Morris off about this um, because, I, because there are clearly expediences. You know, there, there, there's a great deal of expediency for journalism in using freely available tools. But there was literally, I think, in many, many cases, no thought about what this really meant. And the great thing about, you know, Snowden's bravery and his kind of, you know, light on, on how these relationships work is that they really did demonstrate um, vividly for journalists, not just how they needed to protect themselves and their sources, but how systems of power, you know, work now, and particularly in an age of big data and extensible social platforms. Um, and even if you are not going to, you know, be working with highly sensitive information. I don't think you can be an effective journalist these days unless you know exactly what those issues are and unless you understand those systems and you understand that journalism should stand apart from those systems. So some of the kind of you know great things that I was not reading my tweets either when I ran into that woman, but some of those great things that were you know have been tweeted about today in terms of sort of civic um, ci civic acti activity and participation. You know, journalism is the fourth estate for a really good reason. You know, we're not on anybody's side. We're there to hold power to account. We're there to go to jail. You know, we're there to break the law um, when we see that things are wrong. Um, and we're there to uphold freedom of expression for not just ourselves, but, but other citizens as well. And I think that, so I think that there are two, as I say, there are two sides to this, one of which is a much broader question and one of which is a very specific security question. And we're addressing both of them in this great sort of program, which actually Ethan was a, a, a real inspiration for, called Journalism After Snowden. You know, shout out to the sponsors, um, Knight and the Tower Foundation are both backing it, which again is fantastic because we need funding for tools and exploration in this area because it's been, you know, unfunded for too long. And we're up against a lot of money from some serious actors in this. Well, so so let's um, let's turn over to Nate and, and and let's talk a little bit about the tools in the space, um, because you, in my opinion, have sort of taken on a problem that's critically important, um, but also been incredibly challenging. Um, I think many people in this room carrying around mobile phones don't understand that those of us sort of within the human rights and activist community. Um, think of these first and foremost as tracking devices, and then possibly later as communication devices. W what's the Guardian Project trying to do? How far are you on it? And, and, and how has the sort of real and present danger in the Snowden revelation sort of changed how you're thinking about that space? I think the issue of um, trust is now at the forefront of people's minds around what is the technology that I've entrusted my freedom or voice or culture or movement to? And, and that has been a window through which to start getting people to think about these tracking devices in their pockets. So um, the work we've, we're doing began uh, out of my work within the Tibetan independence and, and rights movement where supporting um, Tibetans on the ground in China and Tibet and in protest situations, it became apparent how much these were tracking devices and how they were being used to map a social graph and then arrest lots of people very quickly. So uh, when I began talking about this, um, the only secure tech phone mobile you could get cost quite a bit of money and was being used by military, government contractors, oil companies, things like this. And so on the large scale, the progress that we've made along with groups like Open Whisper Systems um, and uh, other projects that have thought about this is huge. I mean, you can now, take an off-the-shelf $100 smartphone pretty much anywhere in the world and install free open source tools for like Tor, so I work on Tor on smartphones. Mike Tegas is here who does Onion Browser Tor for, for iPhones. Um, encrypted chat, encrypted calling, and it's all free and it works. That's great. The, I think the question comes down to a lot of people is why should I trust you versus trusting Google or Twitter? 
Um, and that's one that we're still trying to sort out as small, scrappy, open source projects that aren't quite Mozilla yet. And I know Mozilla has a lot of, uh, and, and um, the, uh, Mark brought up a great point about app stores. And this is, a, this is one of the biggest issues I think right now is we can build all the apps we want, but we have this barrier of the app store, which is um, for places like China is a huge problem. And so because the gatekeepers are not the open web, we, we, we are a little screwed in some cases, um, but uh, I want to talk about that more because, because that's part of it. Uh, it's just how do you get in front of people, let them know they should use this app, how do you get route right around censorship of apps. Um, ultimately, the, you know, I think we've seen that, and again, this, what Snowden said is, is you know, math works, you know, the fundamental, uh, premise we have has not been broken or shaken. Everything is sound that we're building upon. There might be seven open SSL vulnerabilities tonight that I need to scamper home and deal with. Um, but otherwise, you know, the, we just need to do more and we need to continue to spread the word and ensure people have access to these tools in an affordable way that's not just on a, the latest smartphone. Mm -hmm. it, it, l let me make you Jonathan Zittrain for a moment here. and, and push a little bit on <clears throat> this App Store idea. There, there, there's a couple of things that we often talk about when we talk about security in this space. One of the big things we talk about is users and usability. And certainly getting to the point where you can go and say, download this app and make me secure uh, is an appealing place to be. What's the barrier that we're having at this point with, with Android and Apple App Stores as far as, as trying to bring something like Guardian to market? Uh, I mean, in, in the Google world, uh, there, is an, there is very little barrier, and it's, it's, we have this great opportunity where we can just put, it's gotten w so much better than previously with, with um, Java phones, for instance, and, and telcos, so that we can put our app in the App Store, and it's published globally instantly. Um, and Apple, uh, you know, is a gatekeeper, of, uh, and they, they require more of a process. But what we've seen now is that in places like China, you know, uh, they've, they've removed apps um, based on local requests. So there's local censorship of, of apps. And people don't, aren't impacted in the same way that if there was censorship of DNS or the web. You know, when you hear, oh, this app isn't available in this country, it doesn't seem quite as bad as, as when a website's blocked. Mm. Um, the, you know, and, and increasingly these are, Going back to the trust issue, from a user perspective, people trust the Apple App Store because it seems safer. Less viruses, right? Apple sells this. Trust us, we'll protect you. And I don't want to dismiss the user's, uh, the user's stake in this. You know, I don't want them to say, I don't want to say, well, you're, you're a bunch of idiots because you're trusting a censored system. There is some value to the fact that Apple provides a good service. So it's that balance between what the user needs and benefits from in terms of uh, curation versus the, the you know, the, it, it's a bit of the liberty uh, versus security debate within the App Store world. So thanks for that. <clears throat> um, Jill, I, I, I want to tell a story to ask you a question. Okay. Um, <laughs> so a little bit more than a decade ago, I was in Cairo um, meeting with an Egyptian human rights organization, uh, the Organization for Personal Rights. You and I both know that personal rights in the Arab context translates as gay rights. And I was there to do a security training to figure out why they weren't using Tor and PGP, despite the fact that we trained them three or four times to use Tor and PGP. And the folks there explained that they weren't going to bother using any of this silly security software because everybody knew that the entire internet's traffic was routed through seven computers in the basement of the White House and that the president just read everything that was coming through. And I said, that's crazy, that's totally absurd, how could that possibly happen? And then of course what we found out this year is that more or less that's what happened. Um, <laughs> so the question that I wanna ask as, as a fellow activist in this space is, how do we deal with what I've started referring to as security nihilism? Mm -hmm. Now that we've figured out just how hard this is, how difficult it is to actually keep a channel secure and how to keep a targeted individual able to use these sorts of tools that have been so important in the Arab world and really around the whole world. How is an organization like EFF dealing with this sort of post-Snowden climate of security nihilism? 
Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's, you know, I, I do some trainings in the field and we're developing a, a project called surveillance self-defense that's going to answer a lot of the questions that people have. How do you use the Guardian Projects apps, things like that. Um, and when I talk to people, I get these two different perspectives. One is the Silicon Valley. I mean, we saw in the past couple of weeks, Mark Andres and Robert Scoble both going, well, you know, tis tisking the privacy advocates. Oh, you guys are useless. You know, this is, we're in the post-privacy world and I, I, words can't express how I feel about them. Um, and then on the other side of it, though, you've got the privacy nihilists, uh, the folks who say, you know, this is pointless, everything's being watched anyway, or even, you know, to another degree, um, I'm not going to use Tor because that makes me a target in my country, which is true if you don't have enough users. Um, and so how do we deal with that, I think, is a big and serious question that I can't answer completely, but some of the things that, you know, we've been doing are looking at, okay, well, with journalists, for example, a lot of journalists, you know, are used to taking enormous risks and are willing to take enormous personal risk, um, but maybe aren't realizing that it's not just about them. It's also about their source. It's also about the people they're communicating with. Um, and that's been true for a lot of the other folks that I've talked to that kind of have that approach in the Arab world and elsewhere. Um, you know, I find the other side of the coin actually more difficult to deal with when you have these strong, powerful white male voices from Silicon Valley telling you that privacy is not important um, and their voices, you know, are being heard over our voices. Um, so I actually find that side of the coin much more difficult. But yeah, the, I mean, the privacy nihilists are real too. And I think that, you know, the ease of use and the usability and the, the improved user interfaces of some of these products make it a lot easier for me to get people to use them, for me to be able to say, okay, we're not talking about PGP anymore because PGP is hard. Um, Tech Secure or the Guardian Project apps, not that hard. Um, I, I don't mean to say that to belittle anyone that does find them difficult, and I'm happy to sit down with you if you do and help you through it, but nonetheless, um, I think that this is making it a lot better for us. So, so <clears throat> let's move into um, technocratic uh, white male privilege space and, and, and actually talk about this question of how online culture, commercial culture, maybe sort of tied into all of this. One of the responses to some of the Snowden revelations has been, what's the problem? You're all telling everyone everything on Facebook anyway. Why would you care now that it's government instead of the private sector? Uh, and Bruce Schneier has this wonderful line that I, I actually find myself repeating again and again, which is that surveillance has become the business model for the internet. Uh, that almost all of these large platforms that we're sort of paying attention to, we have this very uneasy, uncomfortable situation with them in which we are giving up an enormous amount of data to have ads targeted to ourselves in exchange for free services. Is there a connection between giving up certain amounts of privacy and targetability in commercial spaces and the fact that, well, in a room like this, we can talk about a post Snowden world, but in terms of mainstream America, we may not have had the sort of outrage and reaction that some of us were sort of expecting from this. Did we somehow set up government surveillance by normalizing corporate surveillance, and, and, and what, can we, what can we do about it? Well, I'm just going to give a quick answer because I want to hear what they have to say as well. But um, basically, you know, first off, there's a difference between, you know, I live my life pretty loudly on the internet. Everything's got my real name. Um, and there's a difference between the things that I say on Facebook or Twitter and the private communications that I have with my sources, my family, whatever. The second thing is a lot of people make the argument that social media companies don't have an army to back them. So their surveillance is not as bad. Well, First off, that's not true. They do have an army to back them. They're in bed with the NSA. Um, but second, so what? That doesn't mean that we should be handing over everything to them. That doesn't mean that, you know, just like governments can change in an instant, so can companies. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if we're talking about the, the sort of hostile takeover of Google scenario or whatever scenario, but nevertheless, I don't want companies to have that information, and that should be a choice. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is where I get to play the sort of crypto-communist um, centralized European on the panel, which of course I am. Um, 
that, you know, I mean, one of the things I've been, I've lived in America now for four years, and one of the, the, the principal cultural difference is really the idea of kind of centralized, some sort of centralized power uh, and alternate kind of balance to, if you like, the corporate world, and really living in a genuine sort of free market market economy where, where, where in America, the, you know, commercial, commercial rules are, you know, sort of the rules. You know, you have a public sphere here, which is basically, as, as, as Clay Shirk, as Ethan, lots of people have said, you know, is really a private sphere, sphere which tolerates free speech. Uh, you know, what we're seeing in Europe at the moment is a kind of pushback against the um, white male kind of technocratic voices. Not necessarily the most intelligent pushback, perhaps, you know, kind of, uh, which is, you know, this idea of, you know, let's, the, the right to be forgotten um, ruling which came down uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, from the um, sort of de de Department of Justice, uh, which which is really about sort of taking things off the internet um, and saying that if you if you don't like the way that your your, your search results render uh, and it's not in the public interest, you can have them removed from uh, Google's cache if you if you if you ask um, if you ask nicely uh, or through the correct channels. Um, so so. It's kind of interesting here because you have very tight, you know, like regulation here is small. Um, and, you know, we're entering a global market where actually the kind of like regulation is much more kind of front and center in, in different markets. Um, and I kind of think that, you know, one of the balances to this enormous kind of cor corporate, I mean, it's, it's kind of an incredible thing because it is, you know, it, American public media is Google, you know, it is Facebook, it is shaping the way that the world communicates with each other. It is imposing, and I say this nicely, you know, American standards of free speech on the rest of the world, you know, and actually in many parts of the world, it's not that simple. Um, so, you know, we, ha we have to have more than, you know, we have to have, I think, you know, a really engaged, intelligent conversation with government. We're not going to get that until you have more kind of engagement, if you like, sort of on the ground. I'm actually, so I, would, I push back a bit, Ethan, in that I'm surprised at how many people here have paid attention to the NSA story. If I go back, ironically, if you go back to the UK, if I go back to the UK, it's had almost no airplay there whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, almost none. And one of the reasons is that something like, you know, the state broadcast of the BBC, it's not state broadcast, but, you know, the licensee has not really run, run with the story. The other press outlets have not run with the story. People have kind of gone, we sort of knew it anyway. Um, we need more vivid illustrations of, of, of why this is really kind of... Um, and you don't need those vivid illustrations, right, in, 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 in countries where people are in jail because, you know, <laughs> because they are vulnerable. Um, but, but here I think that, you know, I, I think that the, the debate is really important that kind of, you know, Snowden was a series of events that pushed it out of the stocks, got it kind of beyond, I would say, Washington, New York, San Francisco. Um, but it needs, you know, it, it, there is a danger that it kind of fizzles out, if you like, as a, as a ground roots issue. And as you say, people just say, well, this is, this is kind of, you know, expedient. For, I, would, I would just like to see more people kind of picking this up as a political issue because we do need regulation and we do need kind of some sort of governance in this area. You know, it's, it's, I, I can't see otherwise how you counterbalance what's essentially kind of, you know, the, 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 the corporate might of, you know, a handful of companies in Silicon Valley. Well, so Nathan, I want to ask about <clears throat> is there a hope that the corporations are going to sort of move around to our side? Are we likely to end up with secure communications software, you know, for our phones. There was a moment in time where some of us thought that Skype was perhaps a step forward and, and, and might be harder to tap uh, than existing telecommunications. That's proven absolutely not to be the case. It, is this a moment where we might see someone move into the commercial marketplace, or is it going to have to be non-governmental organizations, activist organizations like your project that are sort of trying to figure out how to create what turns out to be very difficult to build and, and very powerful software. So in a, continuing a non-US sort of centric view of this problem, one of the apps that I engage with a lot is called WeChat, Weixin from China. You know, this was adopted rapidly over the course of last year by Tibetans and you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of users around the world uh, and now it's being adopted in India of all places at a crazy rate. 
And so WeChat, being that every message you send goes through, you know, Shanghai or Beijing data centers and is subject to filtering and monitoring by the, you know, um, the people that we usually associate with closing down borders from people trying to get out as opposed to inversely surveillancing. They're, they're sort of my, one of my mortal enemies. Like, oh, I hate WeChat. You know, they're just like making my life so much harder. Now, I was at um, a meeting where a researcher had, had started unpacking the code and um, looking at the guts of WeChat. And they decided to surprise me by saying, you know, and we looked in the source code and it found out, turns out they're using Guardian Project software in WeChat. So WeChat uses our encrypted database software, SQL Cipher. Why did a Chinese app company employ database encryption in their mobile app? Um, I think because they cared about protecting their users and they didn't want messages to be hacked or copied. Um, and I think there's, there are strange bedfellows when it comes to users and corporations and data. And we, we're starting to see these sort of post-national interests, which is, sounds scary, um, but it's also useful in that if there's an alliance between users and the services that supports them that goes against sort of government surveillance, then yes, you know, and we, we're starting to see Google doing end-to-end -end encryption um, for that reason, and I think it's very likely we could see um, someone like um, Tencent or, you know, uh, do that. So for us, I, we really see ourselves as reference design. You know, we have an app called ObscuraCam that automatically blurs faces. Uh, when you take a picture. We want every camera app to have that feature. Um, Harlow leads a project called Informacam, which allows you to actually trust a photo is not manipulated when you see it and verify a chain of custody so that when there's a photo of a shark swimming down the East River in New York, you can tell if it's real or not. Um, so all of these things are big ideas and feature designs and reference designs, and we need industry to adopt them. And we need the news industry to adopt these tools and journalists to adopt them as this is the standard practice for protecting sources or verifying media. So I, I think that concept of, of the toolkit or of the library, that it's out there and it becomes pieces that other organizations can use is incredibly powerful. And, and one thing sort of implicit in, in, in your comment, Nate, is that one of the reasons why we'd like large corporations to do this is that the scaling problem around these tools is really, really hard. It's been hard to get to the point where enough people are using Tor that it serves as cover traffic rather than as a clear sign that you have something to hide. But you can imagine if Tor was part of the Mac operating system or Windows or so on Firefox and so forth. Firefox OS. Maybe. Right. You know, that starts getting very, very interesting as far as sort of where, where we figure out where to, to go on this. I wanted to come back to something that Emily said because it, it um, I, I thought your observation that not only are we in a privately held public sphere, but we're in a privately held public sphere that works on US laws, whether we mean it to or not, is really interesting. I was in Myanmar uh, earlier this year. Jillian happened to be there as well. This is what happens when you go to a lot of the same conferences. But we were, bizarrely enough, at a conference of freedom of expression uh, in Yangon, which is not a place that I would have expected to be. But uh, Yangon has actually made some real progress around freedom of expression. And I was talking to a lot of independent journalists and a lot of activists about the internet. And I found out two things. One was the internet is Facebook. In, in Myanmar right now, you don't search on Google because no one knows what Google is. You search on Facebook because that's all you know. And then the second thing was that my activist friends wanted Facebook to be censoring posts. And they very specifically wanted to be going after ethnic incitement and hate speech. And this, for me, as an American who is very, very interested in freedom of expression, was incredibly uncomfortable. I found myself sort of sitting there and saying, but, but guys, like, you can't possibly trust this government. They're going to use this against you at some point fairly soon. The flip side to which was people sort of saying, look, if this is going to be our public sphere, we need it to operate a way other than it's operating right now because this is going to blow up and people are going to get hurt or sort of get killed from this. How do we have this conversation? If Rebecca is right, and I think Rebecca is right, that the really powerful actors in this space are the internet hegemons. Uh, they are the, the powerful platform companies. They do a great deal more regulation of speech right now than formal regulators. How do we sort of open that conversation? How do we have a conversation that deals with 
at least two points of view we have on the panel where I know that Jill feels really, really strongly on freedom of expression and, and making sure that we don't have censorship. And I, and I take Emily to be making a point that some of these standards may actually need to be more local, or if you don't want to take that point, I'll happily take that point. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I would never stand against the American standard of free speech. You know, it's protected, but, but, but you also have First Amendment protections here, which, you know, you kind of don't have in other places. And also, you know, you kind of are actually a pretty self-censoring society as well, you know, and that there are places where, you know, kind of free speech really means, um, can mean kind of, you know, people living in fear of uh, hate speech and kind of, you know, organized um, aggression uh, and, you know, in more volatile kind of situations. And it's, a re it's really difficult because ultimately we should definitely be working towards this kind of, you know, more open standard. But, you know, the main thing is just to get a debate where the major platform companies will even acknowledge that what they do is editorial. So that's the most important thing which is, you know, you hear it time and time and time again, we're just a tech company. They're not just a tech company. And even if they were, everything they do is imbued with what you might call, you know, kind of cultural or editorial standards. So, you know, when you, we can't have this debate with them until the leadership of those companies, until the Mark Zuckerbergs and, you know, the Larry Page, Sergey Brin's of this world, will really engage with it, you know, and not, as, as Gillian says, just kind of go, oh, it's over, we're now into this phase. You know, this is not a glib phrase. You know, these people have enormous power now over how people live their lives, you know, and it needs to be, they need to be brought into that discussion um, because I think that, you know, that we can't, nobody can pretend now that it's not an editorial act to tweak a news algorithm, <laughs> to include or exclude kind of, you know, results from, from, from something that they show. We understand, so, and, and it's journalism's job to understand these systems as well as these companies do, and push against them, because, you know, they are, they are new systems of power that we have to hold to account. Um, you know, I think that the reason that Snowden was so valuable was it was the first time you began to get some acknowledgement. I mean, I've seen Eric Schmidt say, if you want to be safe on the internet, you just have to be very careful what you put on there. You know, they're not saying that anymore, which is, that's one thing, but we have to have more active engagement from, 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 from tech companies. We really do. Well, and, and I think the issue of ethnic violence or I mean, we've seen in China, you know, people labeled as terrorists or local ethnic, and we need to, you know, they're cracking down on uh, Tibetans in self-immolations. Um, and, and if you share the media online of a self-immolation, that is now punishable. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and so there, there's ways that that it is used to persecute. And, and, I, and I respect a society's need to, self, to sort of have harmony, or, or a human's need to have harmony and to have, you know, and, uh, but at the same time, you know, yeah, it, it is, um, you know, what peop one person labels as terrorism and another is a freedom fighter, of course. And you, you raised the really interesting idea a moment ago that Tencent may actually sort of be on the side of increased openness in this space. I, I, I wonder if I can get you to sort of expand on that, not just about Weishin, but maybe also about Weibo. Yeah, the, I mean, it, there, well, again, this idea that, you know, if everyone used Twitter on the planet, we would all be happy. But there's a, there's a draw of Chinese to these platforms because they're native, right? And they're national and they're local and there's pride in that. But I think at the same time, these companies are moving internationally, right? And so Tencent can't afford to have WeChat be seen as a Chinese company, right? Especially in India. And there's all these Indian celebrities who are advertising WeChat to the Indian population. Um, and so that, you know, they want to be they see themselves as Google, as Twitter, as these global. So I think there is a uh, millennial generation of tech companies perhaps that, um, you know, that is, has m more future looking values around, um, you know, having some private communications that are, uh, maybe there's a more nuance coming between the, the public sphere and the private. And this is the Weibo WeChat kind of balance where it's like, well, you should be able to say some things on WeChat you can't say on Weibo. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I think there, there is a technocratic um, 
hope that, you know, or I meet Chinese developers on GitHub all the time, right? And GitHub is this great gathering of, of code. And there's, there's some hope that we all have these same perspectives of what, our, what we should do for the user and, um, and that the governments can get in the way of that. Um, and so we should have end-to-end -end encryption and all, and all these things. So I, I think as a, as a new form of international diplomacy, maybe it has some possibilities. Um, and you know, I'm hopeful that at Google I.O. Uh, happening or any other national gathering of developers that they're, you know, you sort of, m much like the internet task force, you put aside some of the nationalism so that you can make the internet work better. So Jill, you're involved with these conversations every day mm -hmm. uh, with large internet companies as they try to figure out how they navigate both constraint to the internet, censorship, surveillance within different foreign governments, and also as they try to think about what sort of controls they're going to have on this space. How are, how are you talking with these different entities around these questions around surveillance in particular? Yeah, so um, it's really tempting for me to go off into the speech zone, but I'm not going to do that. However, I'll just give an example so that I can try to transfer it back to surveillance. Um, so if you saw over the past couple weeks, Twitter took down some content at the behest of the Pakistani government and then put it back up. Um, and the reason that, that happened from all public accounts is that um, the, Pakist the Pakistani legal order was questionable in nature, uh, Pakistani groups were railing against the decision, etc. Um, and Twitter did the right thing by putting it back up, and I'm, we commended them, EFF commended them on that decision today. Um, but this is exactly the sort of thing that really concerns me. If you look at Facebook or Twitter or Google's transparency reports, they're handing over data to governments where they have no offices and that are not democratic. Um, and so Facebook, for example, right in their transparency report, they give user data to the Pakistani government, and we don't know what that is. So sure, maybe it's a murder case and there's a law enforcement request that is legitimate, or maybe it's not. Um, but it concerns me, really, that these companies are making these decisions by and large without any local expertise as part of it. Um, and so while I can sort of trust, trust Twitter's judgment to um, you know, understand and correctly apply a legal order from, say, Germany or the UK. Um, I don't really trust their judgment because, really, these are companies out in Silicon Valley where this kind of very arrogant error exists. Um, we know everything. We've got this right. This is how it goes. Um, and most of these companies don't have particularly diverse policy teams. Um, and so I think that that's one of the, the big issues here is if you're dealing with user requests for data, if you're dealing with, and I mean, these are, you know, a form of surveillance in a way. If you're dealing with that sort of thing, then you need to be consulting not just with, you know, groups like the GNI, but with local organizations in the country that you're dealing with. And I really, at this point, don't trust these companies to get that right. So with these three remarkable individuals on stage, I want to make sure that we have a chance to open up a conversation. The conversation probably will not be completed during this session, uh, but I am happy uh, to take some questions. And I can see even before I'm rising with the microphone, Rebecca already has a hand up. <laughs> so we're going to give her pride a place with the first question. Uh, but queue up a couple more uh, for other folks who want to get into the conversation. Thanks so much, Ethan. Uh, Nathan, I was really intrigued by your comments on uh, Chinese companies uh, and Tencent and Weibo and so on. And it, uh, you know, I've also seen in some research I've, I've done that uh, some of the Chinese companies are making efforts around consumer privacy and security against hackers and sort of criminal attacks and so on. But do you feel, have you seen any evidence that uh, these Chinese companies are pushing back against data demands from Chinese Public Security Bureau and State Security Bureau at all? No, uh, and and I think my developer optimism maybe is getting ahead of what they're capable of doing as, as companies within the Chinese um, realm. But I do think that they're not as horrible as maybe they're made out to be when it comes to w the state of U.S. companies. Um, and, and so I think there is, um, you know, there's no transparency, and we continue to have reports from our Tibetan groups of people that are uh, detained very frequently after posting things on privately on WeChat. So I, I, that's a very good clarification question. Um, but the, the fact that, um, well, I'm going to test what happens because we're going to be building on top of the WeChat API soon. So we'll see, <laughs> you know, if they block us, right? And, and how, how open their APIs are, I think, is, will be an interesting test. 
So uh, the floor is open for questions uh, regarding surveillance, regarding trust, regarding the transformation of journalism, the tech industry, activism within this space. I am really happy to see the hands coming up, and I will work to uh, get the mic around to different folks. Hi, my name is Caitlin. I work at WNYC. Uh, my question is about um, the sort of migration of journalists to tech companies and the way that they've created all these editorial positions. And I'm sort of, it's an open-ended question, but what do you guys think the responsibility of journalists who make that migration is to sort of change and tackle some of these issues that you guys are talking about? I mean, answer, you know, it's a great question. I think it's to advocate. It has to be out to, to educate and advocate internally and externally about what what journalism actually is. I mean, there's always a there's always a problem when you are a journalist within an organisation which is intrinsically not journalistic. You know, which is that you are a low priority, and particularly if you're you're in a company which is you know, post-IPO uh, needs to kind of service its shareholders, etc. Because journalism isn't going to make many of these companies much money. You know, it's going to actually make it hard for them to make money because you'll be, you know, they will be supporting things which nobody wants to hear, uh, which uh, advertisers certainly don't want to sit against. You know, it, it, it introduces that. But if you, you know, if you do, if you do hop the fence or whatever, and you know, look, there are fan there is no there are fantastic advantages to having platforms like Twitter. I, you know, I advocate for it all the time in my classrooms, but I also say, you know, be aware of how these systems work. So I do think that you know, if 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 you really want. You know, Facebook, um, you know, and, and, and it's great that you have kind of really smart people like Vadim Lavrusic and, and Vivian Schiller now ins inside these companies. But, you know, that's kind of like those are powerful positions now. And I think sort of advocating for what is intrinsically journalistic versus intrinsically commercial is a really important part of that role. I was going to ask, uh, you talked about protecting sources, but... There's a challenge now in, in getting a source. Um, how do you get a government source now? Because, and this, this may be more of a, a journalistic you know, question, but who in the government's going to talk to you if they know the cell phones are, are, are tapped, the emails are tapped? So is there a new way that you operate just to even get sources now? Is it more you've got to get out there and pallet, pound the pavement, or what? I'd like to hear from all on this because I, I think this is really a question about trust and we're sort of all working with different populations on this. So Emily, sorry to cut you off. No, I just no, want to make sure, sure. That everyone gets in on this. Just, just very briefly, Len Downey wrote a great report on this, kind of just a brief, just sort of more or less a couple of months after the Snowden revelations came out, which talked to lots and lots of editors and national security reporters that said, exactly as you say, um, the problem here is not just security around sources, it's the fact that nobody wants to talk. You know, and that's a huge problem. And, you know, whilst you have the kind of arms race of the Obama administration pursuing uh, through, you know, kind of fairly ancient kind of espionage laws, etc., leakers and sources, uh, you're going to have that problem. And that's, that's a huge different area that we need to address because it's not about security, it's about culture. Uh, and I'll short answer one, Barton Gelman, I think, has sort of the best operational security in the business and should be recognized as such. And just, you know, he can tell you how he communicates securely and what he does. Um, and platforms like Global Leaks and Secure Drop and, and platforms that news agencies can put in place that uh, raise the bar for the way they accept submissions of content and such that they, they protect the, their sources by default. So I think there's just, you know, upgrade your skills. It's possible. There's free tools. There's free apps. And there's colleagues who are already, you know, the, the uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation, colleagues who are already engaging with, with this uh, as, you know, pr providing that entry point for new sources. I agree with that. I was going to say just about what Nathan said, but I guess I'll take it one step further and say that, um, and put out a public call for these wonderful platforms like Secure Drop and Global Leaks to take this stuff internationally. We're seeing a lot of US uh, media organizations adopt these technologies, and that's where the outreach has been. But I think that these technologies need to now be adopted by journalism organizations around the world. Hi. Um, <clears throat> quick question. 
I'm, I'm new to newsroom things, but I find the, the idea of operational security for journalists in, new, in newsrooms absolutely fascinating. Um, however, in my discussions with you know, people at various newsrooms, usually in like IT and security there, uh, despite the myriad uh, uh, options that people have, they actually do not recommend anything officially because, um, of course, the stakes are way too high. Um, I was wondering if uh, you, or in the newsrooms that you had been in, um, were there specific instances when there were like practices that were 100% sanctioned, taught, and you know, yeah, exactly. Well, when I was at the, I mean, two things. When I was at the Guardian, um, we first of all, you know, there was nothing that was systematic. And I think that I, this is not just the Guardian; it's in other newsrooms I've been in as well. I think that there were certain practices that individual reporters um, practiced. I think that getting it kind of institutionally supported was um, harder. Uh, and I think we're now entering a new phase. And you know, Secure Drop is, again, one of those kind of tools which you now hear talked about at an institutional level. And that's actually an important distinction to make between individual OPSEC for uh, reporters um, and actually how journalistic institutions say, how are we going to adopt what's good? What should we agree on? You know, what are the standards? Um, and have a conversation, you know, among themselves. Um, so in general, you know, there was the, 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 the standards of security and the types of tools were restricted. The, 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 the other thing that's concerning is restricted to a tiny number of reporters because it was always felt, well, outside that charm circle, nobody else will need that level of security. And, you know, as, as, as Jill and Nathan said, these tools are hard. Sometimes they're not. They've got a lot easier in the last couple of years since I've not been in, new, in newsrooms. But we, we, need, we need kind of you know, more progress on that as well. But also threat modeling. I think that sometimes it isn't possible to guarantee uh, safety. So you need to threat model and your journalists need to think through, who am I exposing to danger here? What can I do about it? What can, you know, it's not all about tools. Some of it is also just about thought process and about, you know, non, you know low, what we call sort of, you know, low tech solutions as well. Um, and that was not, routinely taught and that's where kind of places like you know, the place I work, J schools, have got to kind of, you know, really up their game and and, and close that skills gap. Yeah, I'm going to use my favorite line here and say that um, encryption works, but encryption tools are like condoms. They're 99%, you know, uh, effective when used properly. Um, but really, I mean, that's a thing, that's another thing that really freaks me out is the idea that of people pushing a certain tool as being the savior or NSA proof. If you see that term, run in the opposite direction. I think that, um, I mean, yes, we use a whole bunch of different things at EFF, and I think that all of these tools are really important, um, but I don't want anyone to ever think that, every, that these are going to be perfect solutions. And uh, going back to the nihilism point, which I didn't get to comment on, I mean, one of the places I gain inspiration and hope is from my Tibetan colleagues who, you know, after 50 years of occupation and uh, these odds against a huge state power and the greatest surveillance state that uh, on record, the, um, you know, they're still optimistic and, and ingenuitive and find humor and find solutions and practical ways to move forward. So if you're feeling like you can't do anything or, um, you know, some of the work we're doing with the Safe Travels Online campaign is meant more to give you inspiration to try and to take small steps, you know, and that's what keeps me going uh, and, and that, you know, it's not about uh, complexity, it's about, uh, you know, each in intuition and little decisions you make every day, so. Hi, uh, my name is Ilaria. I work in C-Cell. I'm interested in um, your views on Tor. So Tor, uh, I have a machine that has tails on it and it's unusable. It takes too long to load. There is tons of websites that have been blocked. And the worst part of it is that even though it's very good for certain kind of aspects, 80% of the users on TORS, they use it for illegal purposes. So having this kind of privacy within, without accountability has this kind of side effect. So these kind of tools, while maybe effective, they might cause more harm than goods in some other places. Well, Nathan, I think we're going to make you ask, answer that one first. I have, um, as a developer of Tor, I feel, uh, I, I'll admit my bias. Um, I, you know, I, I, the, the numbers of, of illegal or non-illegal use, I mean, Tor is illegal in lots of places in the world. Um, and 
uh, and I, I know that it, Tails itself, uh, if you're trying to use it for day-to-day -day activities, it, it, it can slow down. Um, I think finding ways that tools like Tor can be useful to you in in day-to-day -day life uh, is is a, a good thing. So saying, you know, you may not need ultimate security of Tails. I run Orbot on Tor on my phone and tablets, and I, I run Twitter through it. And so I say, you know what, I'm going to run all my Twitter traffic through Tor. And that's a great way to use Tor because it doesn't feel slow and people aren't tracking when you're using Twitter. And that's what works for me. I don't use Tails all of the time. So I think there's, um, you know, you have to find what works for you. You have to find where the technology is um, viable. And, and I think that the idea that, you know, I'll push back and say Tor is not slow, and Tor, I can show you streaming video over Tor and, and, and all sorts of fast, uh, usable ways to use Tor. I use Facebook over Tor and Google. So I think, um, ultimately, uh, saying it's not black or white and finding one way that you can use a privacy-enhancing technology in your life today, right now, that works for you is a first step. And don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater because Tails was too much to start with. It's like saying, we're going to switch to, I'm going to have no bags and full organic. I'm going to grow my vegetables and, you know, switching your diet overnight. It's not going to happen. So, yep. so, so I'll speak to that. I mean, I was going to say Tor, you know, I, I recognize that there are places in the world where Tor is nearly impossible to use. Lebanon is a very good example of this. Um, and that's, I know, a thing that they're very conscious of. But in terms of the illegal th uh, use, okay, so, I mean, I guess substitute cars. I'm sorry to use this analogy. Okay. Cars can hurt... <laughs> <laughs> I'm still going with this one, I'm sorry. Um, cars cause pollution, they kill people all the time, um, they run over animals, so let's outlaw cars because they can be used for harm. Um, I think that it's true, sure, Tor can be used for harm, but I think that the incredibly important uses of it, whether we're talking about um, activists in Egypt or people in the US who are looking up um, things about their health that they need privacy for, any whatever the reason, um, I think that the good uses, I don't, I don't wanna say outweigh the bad because that's what life is. It's always about trade-offs. Um, but I think that the um, that Tor is incredibly important for all of those uses, despite the fact that it can also be used for illegal purposes. Google I.O. Uh, happening or any other national gathering of developers that they're, you know, you sort of, m much like the Internet Task Force, you put aside some of the nationalism so that you can make the Internet work better. So, Jill, you're involved with these conversations every day. Uh, with large internet companies as they try to figure out how they navigate both constraint to the internet, censorship, surveillance within different foreign governments, and also as they try to think about what sort of controls they're going to have on this space. I, how, are, how are you talking with these different entities around these questions around surveillance in particular? Yeah, so um, it's really tempting for me to go off into the speech zone, but I'm not going to do that. However, I'll just give an example so that I can try to transfer it back to surveillance. Um, so if you saw over the past couple weeks, Twitter took down some content at the behest of the Pakistani government and then put it back up. Um, and the reason that that happened from all public accounts is that um, the, Pakistan, the Pakistani legal order was questionable in nature, uh, Pakistani groups were railing against the decision, etc. Um, and Twitter did the right thing by putting it back up, and I'm, we commended them, EFF commended them on that decision today. Um, but this is exactly the sort of thing that really concerns me. If you look at Facebook or Twitter or Google's transparency reports, they're handing over data to governments where they have no offices and that are not democratic. Um, and so Facebook, for example, right in their transparency report, they give user data to the Pakistani government, and we don't know what that is. So sure, maybe it's a murder case and there's a law enforcement request that is legitimate, or maybe it's not. Um, but it concerns me, really, that these companies are making these decisions by and large without any local expertise as part of it. Um, and so while I can sort of trust, trust Twitter's judgment to um, you know, understand and correctly apply a legal order from, say, Germany or the UK. Um, I don't really trust their judgment because, really, these are companies out in Silicon Valley where this kind of very 
arrogant error exists. Um, we know everything, we've got this right, this is how it goes. Um, and most of these companies don't have particularly diverse policy teams. Um, and so I think that that's one of the, the big issues here is if you're dealing with user requests for data, if you're dealing with, and I mean these are you know, a form of surveillance in a way, if you're dealing with that sort of thing, then you need to be consulting not just with you know, groups like the GNI, but with local organizations in the country that you're dealing with. And I really at this point don't trust these companies to get that right. So with these three remarkable individuals on stage, I want to make sure that we have a chance to open up a conversation. The conversation probably will not be completed during this session, uh, but I am happy uh, to take some questions. And I can see even before I'm rising with the microphone, Rebecca already has a hand up. <laughs> so we're going to give her pride of place with the first question. Uh, but queue up a couple more uh, for other folks who want to get into the conversation. Thanks so much, Ethan. Uh, Nathan, I was really intrigued by your comments on uh, Chinese companies uh, and Tencent and Weibo and so on. And it, uh, you know, I've also seen in some research I've, I've done that uh, some of the Chinese companies are making efforts around consumer privacy and security against hackers and sort of criminal attacks and so on. But do you feel, have you seen any evidence that uh, these Chinese companies are pushing back against data demands from Chinese Public Security Bureau and State Security Bureau at all? No, uh, and, and I think my developer optimism maybe is getting ahead of what they're capable of doing as, as companies within the Chinese um, realm. But I do think that they're not as horrible as maybe they're made out to be when it comes to w the state of U.S. companies. Um, and, and so I think there is, um, you know, there's no transparency. And we continue to have reports from our Tibetan groups of people that are uh, detained very frequently after posting things on privately on WeChat. So I, I that's a very good clarification question. Um, but the the fact that, um, well, I'm gonna test what happens because we're gonna be building on top of the WeChat API soon. So we'll see, <laughs> you know, if they block us, right? And and how, how open their APIs are, I think is will be an interesting test. So uh, the floor is open for questions uh, regarding surveillance, regarding trust, regarding the transformation of journalism, the tech industry, activism within this space. I am really happy to see the hands coming up, and I will work to uh, get the mic around to different folks. Hi, my name is Caitlin. I work at WNYC. Uh, my question is about um, the sort of migration of journalists to tech companies and the way that they've created all these editorial positions. And I'm sort of, it's an open-ended question, but what do you guys think the responsibility of journalists who make that migration is to sort of change and tackle some of these issues that you guys are talking about? I mean, also, you know, it's a great question. I think it's to advocate. It has to be out to, to educate and advocate internally and externally about what what journalism actually is. I mean, there's always a there's always a problem when you are a journalist within an organisation which is intrinsically not journalistic. You know, which is that you are a low priority, and particularly if you're you're in a company which is you know, post-IPO uh, needs to kind of service its shareholders, et cetera. Because journalism isn't going to make many of these companies much money. You know, it's going to actually make it hard for them to make money because you'll be, you know, they will be supporting things which nobody wants to hear, uh, which uh, advertisers certainly don't want to sit against. You know, it, it, it introduces that. But if you, you know, if you do, if you do hop the fence or whatever, and you know, look, there are fan there is no there are fantastic advantages to having platforms like Twitter. I, you know, I advocate for it all the time in my classrooms. But I also say, you know, be aware of how these systems work. So I do think that you know, if 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 you really want. You know, Facebook, um, you know, and, and, and it's great that you have kind of really smart people like Vadim Lavrusic and, and Vivian Schiller now in, inside these companies. But, you know, that's kind of like those are powerful positions now. And I think sort of advocating for what is intrinsically journalistic versus intrinsically commercial is a really important part of that role. I was going to ask, uh, you talked about protecting sources, but... There's a challenge now in, in getting a source. Um, how do you get a government source now? Because, and this, this may be more of a, a journalistic you know, question, but 
who in the government's going to talk to you if they know the cell phones are, are tapped, the emails are tapped? So is there a new way that you operate just to even get sources now? Is it more you've got to get out there and pound, pound the pavement, or what? I'd like to hear from all on this, because I, I think this is really a question about trust, and we're sort of all working with different populations on this. So Emily, sorry to cut you off. No, I just no, want to make sure, sure. That everyone gets in on this. Just, just very briefly, Len Downey wrote a great report on this, kind of just a brief, just sort of more or less a couple of months after the Snowden revelations came out, which talked to lots and lots of editors and national security reporters that said, exactly as you say, um, the problem here is not just security around sources, it's the fact that nobody wants to talk. You know, and that's a huge problem. And, you know, whilst you have the kind of arms race of the Obama administration pursuing uh, through, you know, kind of fairly ancient kind of espionage laws, etc., leakers and sources, uh, you're going to have that problem. And that's, that's a huge different area that we need to address because it's not about security, it's about culture. Uh, and I'll short answer one, Barton Gelman, I think, has sort of the best operational security in the business and should be recognized as such. And just, you know, he can tell you how he communicates securely and what he does. Um, and platforms like Global Leaks and Secure Drop and, and platforms that news agencies can put in place that uh, raise the bar for the way they accept submissions of content and such that they, they protect the, their sources by default. So I think there's just, you know, upgrade your skills. It's possible. There's free tools. There's free apps. And there's colleagues who are already, you know, the, the uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation, colleagues who are already engaging with, with this uh, as, you know, pr providing that entry point for new sources. I agree with that. I was going to say just about what Nathan said, but I guess I'll take it one step further and say that, um, and put out a public call for these wonderful platforms like SecureDrop and Global Leaks to take this stuff internationally. We're seeing a lot of U.S. Uh, media organizations adopt these technologies, and that's where the outreach has been, but I think that these technologies need to now be adopted by journalism organizations around the world. Hi. Um, <clears throat> quick question. Uh, I'm, I'm new to newsroom things, but I find the, the idea of operational security for journalists in, new, in newsrooms absolutely fascinating. Um, However, in my discussions with, you know, people at various newsrooms, usually in like IT and security there, uh, despite the myriad uh, st uh, options that people have, they actually do not recommend anything officially because, um, of course, the stakes are way too high. Um, I was wondering if uh, you, or in the newsrooms that you had been in, um, were there specific instances when there were like practices that were 100% sanctioned, taught, and you know, yeah, exactly. Well, when I was at the, I mean, two things. When I was at the Guardian, um, we first of all, you know, there was nothing that was systematic, and I think that I, this is not just the Guardian; it's in other newsrooms I've been in as well. I think there were certain practices that individual reporters um, practiced. I think that getting it kind of institutionally supported was um, harder. Uh, and I think we're now entering a new phase. And, you know, Secure Drop is, again, one of those kind of tools which you now hear talked about at an institutional level. And that's actually an important distinction to make between individual OPSEC for uh, reporters um, and actually how journalistic institutions say, how are we going to adopt what's good, what should we agree on, you know, what are the standards. Um, and have a conversation, you know, among themselves. Um, so in general, you know, there was the, 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 the standards of security and the types of tools were restricted. The, 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 the other thing that's concerning is restricted to a tiny number of reporters because it was always felt, well, outside that charm circle, nobody else will need that level of security. And, you know, as, as, as Jill and Nathan said, these tools are hard because sometimes they're not. They've got a lot easier in the last couple of years since I've not been in, new, in newsrooms. But we, we, need, we need kind of, you know, more progress on that as well. But also threat modelling. I think that sometimes it isn't possible to guarantee uh, safety. So you need to threat model and your journalists need to think through who am I exposing to danger here? What can I do about it? What can, you know, it's not all about tools. Some of it is also just about thought process and about, you know, non, you know low, what we call sort of, you know, low-tech solutions as well. Um, and that was not routinely taught. And that's where kind of places like, you know, the place I work, J-Schools, have got to kind of, you know, really up their game and, and, and close that skills gap. 
Yeah, I'm going to use my favorite line here and say that um, encryption works, but encryption tools are like condoms. They're 99%, you know, uh, effective when used properly. Um, but really, I mean, that's a thing. That's another thing that really freaks me out is the idea that of people pushing a certain tool as being the savior or NSA proof. If you see that term, run in the opposite direction. I think that, um, I mean, yes, we use a whole bunch of different things, DFF, and I think that all of these tools are really important. Um, but I don't want anyone to ever think that every that these are going to be perfect solutions. And uh, going back to the nihilism point, which I didn't get to comment on, I mean, one of the places I gain inspiration and hope is from my Tibetan colleagues who, you know, after 50 years of occupation and uh, these odds against a huge state power and the greatest surveillance state that uh, on record, the, um, you know, they're still optimistic and, and ingenuitive and find humor and find solutions and practical ways to move forward. So if you're feeling like you can't do anything or, um, you know, some of the work we're doing with the Safe Travels Online campaign is meant more to give you inspiration to try and to take small steps, you know, and that's what keeps me going uh, and, and that, you know, it's not about uh, complexity, it's about, uh, you know, uh, each in intuition and little decisions you make every day, so. Hi, uh, my name is Ilaria. I work in C-Cell. I'm interested in um, your views on Tor. So Tor, uh, I have a machine that has tails on it, and it's unusable. It takes too long to load. There is tons of websites that have been blocked. And the worst part of it is that even though it's very good for certain kind of aspects, 80% of the users on Tor, they use it for illegal purposes. So having this kind of privacy, Within, without accountability has this kind of side effect. So these kind of tools, while maybe effective, they might cause more harm than goods in some other places. Well, Nathan, I think we're gonna <laughs> make you ask, answer that one first. I have, um, as a developer of Tor, I feel, uh, I, I, I'll admit my bias. Um, you know, I, I, the, the numbers of, of illegal or non-illegal use, I mean, Tor is illegal lots of places in the world. Um, and I, I, and I, I know that it, Tails itself, uh, if you're trying to use it for day-to-day -day activities, it, it, it can slow down. Um, I think finding ways that tools like Tor can be useful to you in in day-to-day -day life are, is is a, a good thing. So saying, you know, you may not need ultimate security of Tails. I run Orbot on, Tor on my phone and tablets, and I, I run Twitter through it. And so I say, you know what, I'm going to run all my Twitter traffic through Tor. And that's a great way to use Tor because it doesn't feel slow, and people aren't tracking when you're using Twitter. And that's what works for me. I don't use Tails all of the time. So I think there's, um, you know, you have to find what works for you. You have to find where the technology is um, viable. And, and I think that the idea that, you know, I'll push back and say Tor is not slow, and Tor, I can show you streaming video over Tor and, and, and all sorts of fast, uh, usable ways to use Tor. I use Facebook over Tor and Google. So I think, um, ultimately, uh, saying it's not black or white, and finding one way that you can use a privacy-enhancing technology in your life today, right now, that works for you, is a first step. And don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater, because Tails was too much to start with. It's like saying, we're gonna switch to, I'm gonna have no bags and full organic, I'm gonna grow my vegetables, and you know, switching your diet overnight, it's not going to happen, so. Yep. so so I'll speak to that. I mean, I was going to say Tor, you know, I, I recognize that there are places in the world where Tor is nearly impossible to use. Lebanon is a very good example of this. Um, and that's, I know, a thing that they're very conscious of. But in terms of the illegal th uh, use, okay, so, I mean, I guess substitute cars. I'm sorry to use this analogy. Okay. Cars okay. can hurt... <laughs> <laughs> I'm still going with this one, I'm sorry. Um, cars cause pollution, they kill people all the time, um, they run over animals, so let's outlaw cars because they can be used for harm. Um, I think that it's true, sure, Tor can be used for harm, but I think that the incredibly important uses of it, whether we're talking about um, activists in Egypt or people in the US who are looking up um, things about their health that they need privacy for, any whatever the reason, um, I think that the good uses, I don't, I don't wanna say outweigh the bad because that's what life is. It's always about trade-offs. Um, but I think that the, 
that TOR is incredibly important for all of those uses, despite the fact that it can also be used for illegal purposes. So, so one of the many things we try to do at this conference is we try to set up panels, discussions, talks that are going to give us fodder for discussion when we head out and have drinks and have dinner. <laughs> and questions about where we go with TOR is definitely one of them. But uh, Miha Sifri is, is always uh, suggesting to me uh, that one of the jobs in life is to ask a good question. Uh, so I'm going to ask him to sort of close off our conversation by asking a good question. Ooh. I'll make sure I end with my voice going up. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a three, one question for each of you. So, Emily, uh, my surveys of journalists in the U.S. suggest that at the moment, the number of American journalists using any sort of secure communications is somewhere between one and five percent. Why is that? What can we do about that? Uh, Jillian, same question, but related to activists. Um, and Nathan, my question for you is, um, who pays to develop these tools? I'm a big uh, worrier about the adage that if you're not paying for something online, that's because you're the product. So you, you are giving away these tools for free, but shouldn't we be paying for them? So three fantastic questions. Let's start in the order that they were delivered. Um, OK, well, 1 in 5% you know, is uh, exactly where you would expect it to be. And I think the answer to that is because American journalists haven't felt the need to, and they haven't been aware of what the risks are or the threats are, um, and they haven't really seen how this arc is going to progress because they're busy people and they've got a lot of stuff to do, you know they've got a lot of stuff to do, and this this stuff gets in the way, you know. So you've got lots of stories to kind of write. Uh, have you got time to stop and learn all of this stuff, you know, this opsec stuff? That actually is it, you know, you're a kind of like you're a local education reporter. Is that really does that really matter to you? Um, and I think that what we know now, and what Snowden has shone a light on, is that everybody needs to do this, you know, because journalism needs its own channels of communication. Um, uh, you know, I was at a bar association meeting where actually a very senior lawyer came up to me afterwards and went, "Oh my God, I hadn't realised that of course the people that we are representing." You know, we have no client confidentiality now. So it's not just journalists. Um, and this is the start of an educational process. So, you know, we have to be really active in that as J schools. You know, journalists have to be really active in, in, in reporting it. And, you know, and the technology community, I hope, will be active in helping us, you know, figure out what these problems are and come up with some robust and, and easy to adopt solutions. Um, okay, so my answer, I'm going to keep it short. Um, I think the first thing is that the developers need to listen to their constituents, listen to their users, and take their feedback seriously. Um, another thing is make these tools multilingual. Start from that premise. Um, don't assume that your user base speaks English or can, even if they do, that they can use the tool with English instructions. And then the third one, I'm going to paraphrase an Egyptian friend of mine um, and say that uh, until these tools are as easy to use as a toaster or remote control, um, a lot of people aren't going to use them. And so I think we're getting there, and I think that that's one of the keys, is make these things seamless uh, to integrate into your normal daily life. And, you know, the, in terms of who's paying for this now and who should be paying for it down the road, uh, you know, we're lucky right now to benefit from various funding sources, including the Internet Freedom Initiatives of the U.S. government through groups like the Open Technology Fund. So your taxes are paying us if you're an American or if you're Dutch or if you're a few other governments, <laughs> Swedish maybe. Um, the uh, Night News Foundation gave us a generous grant for work on InformaCamp, so foundations and Ford and uh, OSI and other groups, so foundations have taken an interest in this, and Eric Schmidt himself gave us some funding. Uh, and, you know, I think that can, that can go on for a while. That can go on for a certain period of time, um, but it can't go on forever, and, and, and we need to, um, you know, I mean, uh, Mozilla, you know, I need to talk more with Mozilla and Apache. And you know, they've figured out really fascinating ways to get lots of money from corporations and donations. And, and I think, you know, I, ultimately I'm really excited to see what someone like Silent Circle is attempting to create a business model around privacy and security. Unfortunately, the minute you go that route, you tend to start prioritizing corporations and military and kind of not the people that I really, I used to do that work and I'm not, 
I want to help people that maybe can't pay or don't have a credit card. So I, I, I'm, I'm looking for a longer term plan and help with that. And, and I believe it, again, Mozilla, Apache, Linux, other web foundation, I'm inspired by those groups because they've proven you can do this for 20 years um, and, and more than just my two or three year grant horizon in my head. So, so um, <clears throat> let's get a round of applause for our very, very smart and engaged and uh, extremely helpful panelists here. And I think they're all around for dinner and drinks. Um, and I'll help you install apps. Well, so if you want to continue this, either on the geeky level of what should I do, or on the higher level of what does this mean about trust, what does this mean more broadly, these are three terrific people to connect with. And in general, please keep in mind, one of the big reasons we do this is the hope that we can spark some interesting conversations and maybe collaborations, which is why at this point, there is an open bar before <laughs> dinner. So please head on out. Thank you all for a really long, informative, but wonderful day. And thanks for hanging in with us and have a wonderful evening.